our sermon text this evening. So I take it there's just these two hymns. I'm not missing one. I have a tendency to miss things. Yeah. My excuse is I just turned 70, so that's it. In that generation. We're going to read the Word of God from Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, and we'll be beginning in this chapter in verse 25. Acts chapter 8 and verse 25. This is an account of Philip the Evangelist and his meeting with the Ethiopian eunuch. Let us hear God's word as it is read. And do remember, it is not merely the words of men. This is the word of the living God. And therefore, it is infallible, inerrant. There's no mistakes in it. And it is written for our learning. Let us hear him. And so when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And so he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake the chariot. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I? Except someone guides me. And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. Who will declare this generation? For life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. And now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way, rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Beloved, the book of Acts provides the infallible record of the church and the spread of the gospel. And the book begins with the resurrected Lord speaking to the gathered disciples where Jesus tells the believers in Acts 1.8, and I see you have it in your bulletin as a key text, as it really sets, if you will, the thrust of the book. You will receive power from the Holy Spirit who has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. But it was not until several years later 
when persecution started that's recorded at the first part of Acts chapter 8 that the church started fulfilling God's call. In Acts 8, we are reintroduced to this Christian man named Philip. And by verse 25, you see Philip has been to Samaria and he's crossed those racial and ethnic barriers. And now God's going to use him in an unusual way. I think in part to teach us a lesson about how evangelism and salvation work. How much do we play in people being saved? Does our understanding of God's sovereignty negate all man's responsibility? What if you want to share Christ, but you're not sure what to say? And what do we believe about the process of being saved or becoming a Christian? We need clarity on these issues. I remember... Dr. Clowney once shared with a group that he had asked in one of his classes at Westminster Seminary for the students to give a simple statement or explanation of the gospel. And you would think that he was pulling teeth. They hemmed and they hawed and they came up with long theological explanations trying to get every conceivable theological concept packed into the statement and he can't, he, I think he summarized it by saying, can't you simply say Jesus saves? That he died on the cross for our sins? You've got to understand, it's a very clear message. It's not hard to understand. It's impossible to believe on our own. It's not hard to understand, it's a very simple message. You either believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, or you're going to perish in hell. For eternity, because you're bearing your own sins. You've not had them remedied. But it's a very clear message. The sad thing is many don't believe it. That's the issue. And that's what Philip brought to the Ethiopian. What hindered him from being baptized? Do you believe or not? And he gave a great confession of his faith in Christ. we we'll come to that again. The theme in this message that is that saving people is God's work. Sharing the gospel is ours. Because God gave it to us. Sometimes what God calls you to do will not make sense. I think we certainly have that here in this passage. Philip was having an outstanding ministry in Samaria. I mean, you could say he was wildly popular. He was well-received. And in verse 8 of this chapter, it says, there was much joy in that city that was flowing from their, his preaching and teaching. And in verse 12, it says, people were believing and being baptized. And then, out of nowhere, we read in verse 26, an angel of the Lord comes to Philip and says, rise Go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And my first thoughts were, and I wonder if Philip thought this way, you've got to be kidding me. I'm having a successful ministry here. And you want me to get up and go in the desert? You don't start a church in the desert. But God does that at times. He does this to do thing, have us do things that we just have a hard time accepting. But people need to hear the gospel and God calls people in response to that need. He calls them to leave a successful evangelistic movement and to go to a place that seems completely inappropriate for that kind of work. In that day and time, there were only two roads to Gaza. This one in verse 26 that went through the desert was seldom used. So not only does God call Philip to go to the desert, he tells him to take the worst road where nobody will be on it. 
just doesn't make sense, humanly speaking. And while God was speaking to Philip in one area, he's going to do something else in the desert. When I first went to Carbondale, Pennsylvania, to, uh, there was not a church existing there. I was called to, as a home missionary. And I had some people tell me, you'll never start a church there. The town is 95% Roman Catholic or more. Old world Catholicism. If you've ever been up in the coal country of Pennsylvania, you'll see that. It's common. And uh, they said, you'll never start a church there. And I thought, no, I won't. I'll never start a church anywhere. But if God wants a church there, there'll be one. Because we labor in vain unless the Lord builds the house. I don't start the church. I don't do that. I take part in it, in the building of it, in the building of his kingdom. But God is the one who must give that increase. You know that well. And we give him all the glory for it. And God puts... Churches and people were often, ordinarily, you would think they would never be. But we have to have, a, you know, we do our demographic studies and we get the economy of a local area and we require a certain number of families and all this and then we say, ah, well now you can go. But oftentimes churches have started because people had Bible studies in their businesses or in their homes and only had a few people and it grew into something. Because God was at work. And people have tried, and not that you shouldn't study and know areas, and you ought to have a certain number of people before you do some things, yes, but you can do all that and it still fails. You don't have a church unless God is in the midst of it. You can say, placing his candlestick, if you will. God always has a plan. And the plan here was the Ethiopian eunuch and his conversion. What do we know about him? Well, he was a court official. He was in charge of the treasury for the queen of the south. Sort of like the minister of finance or the secretary of the treasury. So obviously he was educated. He was trusted. He could read his, he was reading the Hebrew Bible. I doubt that he had a translation into his particular language of Ethiopia at that time. We know that he was a God-fearer. He knew of Jehovah God. He knew of the worship in Jerusalem at the temple. And God-fearers had a place in the outer court. And they could come and worship. And so Philip and the Ethiopians meeting, as we are allowed to see here in the pages of Scripture... It's not a product of human ingenuity. It was God's sovereign hand bringing them together. For the Ethiopian to hear the gospel and to be saved. You know, God's sovereignty is a very practical thing. And if you're a Christian, God orchestrated your salvation. I like using that word, orchestrated, like a conductor. He got all the different musicians together to make... Beautiful music, if you will. That's what a conductor tries to do. And the events of your life to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ were orchestrated by God. John 6.44 tells us, No one can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws him. Unless God's orchestrating it, it's not going to happen. But also remember that in that sovereignty, he's controlling every step you take. Now, I travel a lot in missions, and often I think about, who is the Lord going to put beside me in that airplane seat this time? And, you know, it's not always easy. You know, I want to talk to people about the Lord, but sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm just scared to death. I mean, I'm getting vibes off this person. They don't want me there. They don't want to talk to me. You know, they don't want to look at me. You know, but I, I want to talk to them about the Lord. I know that's my responsibility. So I've got to do something. And I recall one 
event, this fellow came and he sat down and he said, well, thinking, Lord, how do I get talking to this guy? Well, I'll just get out my Bible and start reading. And that did it. He started asking me questions. And by the time I got off the plane, he was weeping over his soul. He was an airline pilot that was going for training in Dallas and we were on the plane together, but his life was just a mess. His marriage was falling apart. He was afraid he was going to lose his wife and his children and everything. And providentially, I just preached in the church right near where he lived and I was able to point him to a good church. You never know. I had, I've had others tell me, I had one fellow shared with him the gospel. He says, I don't believe that. And I said, it doesn't surprise me. I'm more surprised when I find people who do believe it. And that's the issue. Do you believe? We want to point people to have faith in Jesus Christ. Never forget that in the process of evangelism and salvation, it's God who's in control of things. We think we pick out the seat number and we sit where we're going to sit and that's my seat, I got it on my ticket. But you're not going to get it unless God sovereignly brings it to pass. Even that person sitting next to you. Think about it. You don't know all their background and everything, but you may be that very person that God has called to help them come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Well, you're certainly not going to do that if you keep your mouth shut and you don't talk to them. We do have that responsibility. We come to that. In verses 26 and 27, Philip immediately responds to this man, or first, excuse me, he immediately responds to God who brought this angel to speak to him told him to rise up and go south and it just simply says he rose and went and you know that's the way we've got to be ready to share the gospel when God calls us to it he puts me in that seat next to that stranger I have to look at it that way at least sit there praying trying and it's not easy I know it's hard I don't I'm not some I'm not like golden mouth you know one of the church fathers that can just Rile it off and everybody just falls down and not at all. Sometimes the discussions are very difficult. One time my wife and I were flying together and this Jewish lady sat next to her and to us, to me in particular, and I got talking to her. And she started telling me about, you know, in the, during World War II and the Holocaust, they were writing to their family there and Letters got longer in between. Finally, they didn't hear anything for the longest time. And they got a letter from a neighbor who said, don't bother writing anymore. There's nobody left. And she said, from that moment, my whole family said, we have nothing to do with God. Look what God has done. Now, what do you say to that? Well, the words the Lord gave me to say was, God didn't do that. Man did it. Adolf Hitler did it. The Nazis did it. The Gestapo did it. God didn't do it. Here's what God did. God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish. That's God's promise. But you'll have everlasting life. And I said, please, you, know, you don't have to take my word for it, but read the Gospel of John when you get home. You know, get a Bible and read the Gospel of John. See what Jesus said. Just see who he is. See what he did. See what he said. And she promised she would. The Lord knows. That's one thing I always say to people. You know, no matter how your discussion may go with someone about the Lord, just encourage them, please read the Bible. You don't have to take my word for it. It was reading the Bible that converted me in a jail cell having gotten there with a murderer on this wrist and a rapist on this wrist and me in the middle. Seriously. Someone put the Bible in the jail cell and I read it and I read it and I read it and I read it. Got out of jail like a dog returning to his vomit. 
back in jail again. And I called upon the Lord. And finally, God made me keep my word, and he converted me. I'm coming to him. Lord, if you just get me out of this. I had to learn that only he could get me out of it. And only he could keep me out of it. By his sovereign grace. Now, you look at Philip. God, he didn't question God. He just went down that deserted road to that deserted place. And you know, God may call you to do something difficult too. And the door opened. I got involved in Nepal. A brother came to our class this meeting in, in uh, Shafter, California, from Nepal. And he said, you know, we, you know, I need somebody to come and teach the Reformed faith in Nepal. I said, I'll go. Because you asked me. <laughs> and the door is open. He didn't think I would go. But the Lord provided and we were able to go. Uh, that was 2015 or 16. 2016, the first time, then 2017, and Lord willing, soon again. The doors are open. And uh, there are many people who have never heard the gospel in this country. They've heard some perverted thing from the media. But they've not really heard the gospel. And it especially hasn't been delivered to them in the hands of somebody who knows the Lord and who loves the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the proper vessel to take the gospel. Philip was obedient. Philip was also bold. It says in verse 27, the Ethiopian was traveling back from worship and he was reading Isaiah. And from verses 29 and 30, we see that the Spirit says to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And so Philip ran and heard him reading Isaiah. And he boldly asked him, do you understand what you're reading? You, you, you see, Philip, in a sense, is imposing himself. He's pressing the issue, asking the questions. That's what we've got to do with people. Like George Whitfield, the great evangelist to the Americas in the 19th century said, if he spent but a half hour with the man, he must speak to him of Christ. Philip went as he was called. Now if God is sovereign, and we know he is, he could have used any means to save the Ethiopian. He could have sent an angel. He could have sent Isaiah in a vision. But God has chosen to use people. The Lord Jesus has said to you and me, you are the light set upon a hill, not to be hid under a bushel basket. You, the people of God. Now, I like to think of it, we're reflecting the light of Christ. We're not shining ourselves. But we're reflecting Christ to this generation. We're to be that light. God has chosen to use people that came to Christ. Someone handed me the Bible and then shared with me the gospel because God orchestrates salvation and then he uses men in sharing that gospel message. Francis of Assisi, you've, I know you've heard of him. He is to have said, preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. Now that's a cute saying. It was even quoted at President Bush's funeral recently. But the fact is you can't preach the gospel by simply living a good message or a good life. It doesn't explain to them who Christ is, why he came into this world, what he accomplished on the cross. It doesn't tell them of the great transaction of our sins for his righteousness. It doesn't tell them that. There comes a point when a verbal explanation is necessary. 
It wasn't enough for Philip to walk beside the chariot with a nice Christian attitude and a big smile on his face. He had to get up into the chariot and verbally share the gospel. Again, you know what that means. It means you, Grace Church, here in Modesto, you are the evangelism program. Not your pastor, your elders or deacons or everyone else or a special office for evangelists. You are that office bearer. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Every believer has that office. To share the gospel. It doesn't negate the office of a pastor, of a minister of the word. I'm not saying that. And some are more gifted than others. God gives gifts. But every one of us is to give account of the hope that is within us. In the words that we know to, to frame our confession. In your neighborhood, in your school, on your team. When it comes time to speak to someone about Christ, you don't need to fear. The Lord is with you. He tells us to go into the world and that he'll be with us to the end of the age. When you step back from this passage, you see God at work. God speaking to Philip. The Ethiopian is under conviction. And the Spirit tells Philip to go up into this chariot. All of this to show us that the results are not dependent upon us, but powered by God. Saving people is God's work. But sharing with people is ours. He still sent Philip. To evangelize the Ethiopian. Now, back to verse 25 again. You read what John and Peter were doing as they traveled. It says, now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritan. And that gospel is found in the passage that the Ethiopian eunuch is reading. It's Isaiah 53. The suffering servant. Not as Zionists say, the nation of Israel. But as the gospel is, the person of Christ. He is the suffering servant. The Ethiopians reading this passage in Isaiah that points to the substitutionary death of Christ. And that's what Philip explains to him. He doesn't understand this. Who is it that's being led as a sheep to the slaughter? A lamb before its shearer is silent. He opens not his mouth. Philip explains that to him. It's Jesus. The promised Messiah. The anointed one of God. He wants the eunuch to see him as John the Baptist saw him. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Philip opens his mouth, it says, and beginning with this scripture, he just, that's his starting point. What did he do? He preached Jesus to him. And that's amazing. Doesn't Luke tell us a similar story like that? On Emmaus Road, we have the Lord Jesus himself. The resurrected Christ is walking with these disciples. In Luke 24, 27, Jesus says this about himself. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Oh, that's what we need to do. The Bible is Christocentric. I'm not saying that every verse is strictly, you know, saying Christ's name or giving us a new doctrine on the person and work of Christ, but they all relate to him in one way or another. Or they don't have meaning. God simplified it when he said at the baptism of his son, hear him, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. Salvation is centered on Christ. 
It's not centered upon the church. It's not centered upon John Calvin as much as we may love and respect him. Or Zwingli or Luther. Or any other man. It's the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is to be given preeminence in all things. All things. This passage should drive our philosophy for evangelism and church growth. Here's what I mean by that. I think there are so many props and gimmicks, manipulation in the pulpits today because we've lost confidence in the power of the gospel. And yet scripture tells us, as Paul would write in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Philip didn't get up into the chariot and do a balloon trick. He didn't get into the chariot and tell the Ethiopian how God would bless him financially or heal his body or make him happy. Philip took the word of God and explained Jesus to him. You have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need a Savior and he is Jesus and only Jesus. There is only one who is redundantly only begotten Son of God. Only one. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Him. All the other ways are false ways. False shepherds. False gates into the sheepfold. There's only one who is the good shepherd. And He is Jesus. Affirm that message unequivocally to this world. It needs that affirmation. I remember at the end of, at, of George Bush's funeral. I mean, there were so many parts and it was so beautiful, so Christian, so Trinitarian. And then they get this liberal up there to just vilify the gospel. Just to want to pervert it and destroy it. That's where liberalism takes you. It takes away the power of the gospel. It starts giving you humanistic claptrap. She didn't say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's a way, a truth, a life. That's abominable. There aren't many ways. But the liberalism believes that, though. Oh, we're all just on the same path. We're all heading to the same God. And, you know, it's all going to be just wonderful in the end. No, it's not. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. That's the truth of Scripture. That's the truth of our Lord's teaching. You see, salvation is centered on Christ. Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this Scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. Just telling people, oh, your, your sins are gone. There's no such as things as sin. That doesn't help them. It ruins them. You go to the doctor. He knows you have cancer, but he just says, oh, you're okay. Don't worry about it. You're fine. Be warm. Be merry, you know. Be filled. Be, you know. All of Philip's teaching went back to Jesus. The saving power of God is wrapped up into the person and work of His Son and no other. Our salvation begins and ends with Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author and finisher of our faith. And we must remember, the determining factor for your relationship with God is not based upon what you have done. But it's on what He has done. Our faith is in His death, His cross, His resurrection. 
That's how it's applied. And verse 36 shows that the Ethiopian believed, and so he desired baptism as a symbol of his new faith. He knew it meant to be identified with Christ. And he saw the water, and he said, what prevents me? What prevented him is whether or not he believed or not, but he gave a good confession, didn't he? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe. And that's the issue with every man, woman, and child. We're either believers or unbelievers. We're in a state of unbelief or belief. There's no in-between. Now, for you and I, it may be hard to discern where somebody is spiritually. I'm not saying that it's not. There are times when you don't know with people. The human mind can be very mysterious in the human spirit. But in God's sight, there is no middle road. He knows the heart. He tries the heart. And here, this passage gives us that structure of salvation. Saving people is God's work. Salvation is executed by man in the sense that we share the gospel. It's based upon God's word of teaching who Jesus Christ is, his person, his work. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Philip's got another assignment. God's got more use for him. And moves him to another place. Sometimes you forget that the sole purpose of the gospel is, is not only forgiveness of sins, but the purpose of the gospel is for man to be restored into fellowship with God. And that's what happened with the, with the eunuch. Don't miss that. That's why when Philip leaves, you think, oh, he's going to be sad. This guy who taught me about the Lord, oh, don't go, don't go. No, it says the eunuch's rejoicing. He's happy because he has the Lord. He knows the Lord. He's been restored to God. He doesn't need Philip. Philip didn't save him. God did. And when that forgiveness comes, when we know the forgiveness of our sin, I remember for me when that transpired, that knowledge broke through the darkness of my heart. It was like a newborn calf dancing in the field. I could see again, and my senses were returned. Behold, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. So you were designed to experience the joy of God that's found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A joy that goes beyond the thin shrill of fleeting happiness. A joy that's founded upon the rock, and that rock is Christ. My testimony is found in the Psalms. He lifted me up out of a miry pit and set my feet upon a solid rock and established my goings. That rock is Christ. Hold forth Christ. To this generation, beloved congregation of the Lord. Thank you for the privilege of being here and opening the scriptures with you this evening. Let's pray before we turn to our hymn.